Well, hi guys, I'm back. Um, sorry about last week. Uh, life kind of happened here at our house. Uh, so, uh, just picking it up with our video lectures again and uh, keep rolling, right? Uh, hope you guys have been doing well, uh, keeping up with your assignments and everything else. Um, and if you want a live classroom time, please let me know. Um, leave it in the comments or something like that, uh, would be supreme. Um, as for that, uh, I will have some announcements and stuff as we push towards the end of the semester and what your final is going to look like real soon. Um, haven't put that together exactly yet, but uh, it is floating around somewhere in my brain. Um, but I thought today we would talk about uh, freedom of speech and assembly and all of that because, hey, it's kind of in the news, in case you missed it. Um, with all of this lockdown and stuff, finally people are starting to get a little bit, um, I guess, antsy, aggravated, who knows, um, and have begun protesting by gathering together. Uh, some of those protests are interrupting traffic patterns to hospitals as well, so brilliant, guys. Um, and, you know, mixed with all of that is, you know, our president making tweets like, liberate Michigan and liberate Wisconsin and, and, and stuff, when within a few days before, he said, I have the absolute right, which obviously he didn't. Um, so yeah, where do we fall with all of that? Um, the chapter on free speech in your textbooks talks about free speech on campus because, hey, this is a college course and that's a thing. Um, and there have been issues in the past few years about certain groups inviting speakers in and then another group on campus protesting that, um, and not just protesting or voicing their opinion or dislike or dissent, but those protests became, well, violent. Um, the textbook lists a couple of them. I won't bore you by reading straight from it. Um, I will leave that to you guys to find your own boredom on your own time. But that's an issue. You know, where does the line fall between right and responsibility? How do we protect freedom of speech and thought and expression and protect people who might be harmed by the excesses of speech and expression? It is quite the quagmire, right? What words can we say and not say? And can some people say those words, but others not, right? Obviously, I am a white male teacher, and there are some words that I am not allowed to say. We label them, right? Not simply the bad words that I occasionally used during my lectures, but, you know, as we talk about protected speech and hate speech, you know, certain racist or racial terms, some folks can say them, some folks cannot. Well, that's not fair. And yet, specifically, I'm speaking of the N-word, right? And yet, we limit our own speech all the time. I do not call anyone else dear or honey except for my wife, because in that context, it's completely appropriate. But if I said that to, I don't know, one of my students, that's grounds for reprimand, if not firing. And it should be. I might have the freedom to say that word without being arrested. But does that give me freedom from all consequences that might be associated with it? Hmm? 
in my other job as a minister, I revel in the fact that I get to freely express my faith on the given day that we choose to do that. But what if I don't like someone else's religion? Should I be able to say, hey, we should arrest those people because they worship on Saturday, not Sunday? Or should I say, well, while I might disagree with some of their beliefs, or maybe even some of their practices, I uphold their right to do that. Sometimes that nuance is lost on us, on others. So how do we work that? And is there an in irreconcilable tension between protecting the freedom of speech and protecting people from harm of hateful speech? I think this chapter does an incredible job, it is, by the way, chapter 16, Free Speech on Campus, of, of laying out those issues for you guys. So I, I really want you to read it, um, and there will be a homework based on it, so that's on you. But I just, I wanted to highlight how that has changed, because I didn't understand where maybe you kids, are coming from, where, where students are now, because, yeah, I'm an old white guy, what do I know? That among students, among folks your age, there is a humongous tendency to, to be willing to limit speech, to have laws that say you can't say these kinds of words or these kinds of phrases or etc. because it might harm this group or it will harm this group, right? Um, where I grew up in a, in a very different world and era, in which the, there were times when the government tried to limit speech and expression especially when people were protesting against the actions of the government. Well, we can't limit that, can we? And I know it is a bit of a slippery slope argument, but once we start limiting freedom of speech, where does it stop? And how? What is the marker by which we limit it? That is the key question, right? Well, if it is speech that creates offense. Well, what does that mean? Right? I might be offended by a lot of things that the president says. Is it okay for me to do something about that? And if so, what? Right? Um... It's, it's a very contentious issue, and, and I truly do understand that, yes, there are some words or phrases or just manners of expression that are definite, overt hostilities, right? Kill the blank. Yeah, that's a threat. Is there a difference between that and saying, hey, white pride is a thing? Hmm. Ooh, right? I felt kind of uncomfortable saying that. Why? Should I not be proud of my heritage? Should I only feel shame? Because of where my ancestors came from? Interesting questions. By the way, my ancestors were... Uh, I actually have no idea. I'm one of those Heinz 57 mutts. Huh. 
Hard to tell. But getting back to the issue of free speech and campus and hate speech and what should be restricted, right? That's, that's where we are. How do we reconcile that tension? Because on the one side, you have those who say, no, free speech cannot be abridged. Because the second that you start saying that here's our, here are words that you are not allowed to say, somebody says, well, why? Well, because they might, they offend this person. Well, you restricting what I can say offends me. If mere offense is our marker, then there is no right to free speech at all. So I want to bring us over to that little thing that is causing the issue, right? The First Amendment, that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people to assemb to peaceably to assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Whew, wordy, right? Of course, the part that we are concerned about is that freedom of speech, and the press, and uh, assembly to some degree here in this. Now, one might quite observantly point out that it says Congress shall make no law. However, our states and our institutions, especially our educational institutions like your high school, like Stark State, can make certain bans or limits to freedom of speech, right? I don't get up on a Sunday morning behind the pulpit, which actually now is also on YouTube, and say, hey, listen up, you motherfuckers. Sorry, I don't do that in the middle of a Sunday worship service. There are limits. There is propriety, right? However, on the highway... When somebody cuts me off, I'm happy to show them the one-finger salute. That's what one of the inserts here, this, the one on who can say the N-word, points out incredibly well. Context. Context matters. It is a key to that. When I was about... You know, in, in my high school to college years, there were, and actually before that, uh, in the 80s, there was a movement to ban certain books from public schools and, and their libraries, specifically the works of Mark Twain, Huckleberry, you know, all of those that, because of their use of the N-word and their portrayal and kind of the casual acceptance of the institutions of slavery and the mistreatment of blacks in this country. And I remember seeing that debate and going, that's weird. That's strange. Yeah, I, you know, and, and usually it was, you know, uh, very concerned suburban moms who didn't want to raise racist children. And, and I understand that desire to protect young minds, uh, to protect minorities, to protect those who are disenfranchised or easily maligned or pushed aside. But banning words, banning books, banning thought banning education did not seem to be the right way to do that. It seemed to me that a better course would be to, hey, let's read the book and discuss it and learn from it. 
because I think the major lesson we get is that Mark Twain was no racist. He was portraying what society was and writing a condemnation against it in a very subtle and subversive way. But that's just my opinion. And I'm free to express it. And you're free to disagree. You might tell me, no, you think Mark Twain was an absolute racist. Okay, maybe I'm wrong. I'm willing to listen to that. Maybe I'm not. Another thing this chapter points out, and, and, and one that I, that I really struggled with understanding, especially when those protests, especially the one at UC Berkeley uh, featuring, and sorry, I have to read the name because I cannot remember, Milo Yiannopoulos, turned violent. And I was like, wait a second, these are, to ex you know, trigger warning, you know, these are snowflake liberals who got violent about a right-wing pundit? Hmm. It, it, it confused me. And, you know, this chapter points out that it's, it's a small step is that if we think that words are violence, then people, those who believe that words are violence, believe it is justifiable to use violence to stop those violent words. I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Uh, you know, as you read the chapter, do you agree with that sentiment? Um, in fact, I, I think I'll make that part of the homework, but there'll be a more formal write-up of that to come. In a way, freedom of speech is, is, a, is a right, but is it an absolute right? And the answer to that question is, is no. It is not a right that supersedes all others. However, it is foundational to them. If I do not have the freedom to express my own opinion, right or wrong, conclusions, understanding of the world, my own thoughts, then do I have any freedom at all? We look at oppressive regimes like North Korea, China, Iran, where saying the wrong thing, saying something that disagrees with the state, that is critical of the powers that be, gets you into trouble, either arrest or exile or killed. That that is scary. And when we start to limit speech, we start to limit thought. When we start to limit thought, we limit truth and progress. But I think it is also important to protect those around us. If I say something that offends you, you should have the right and ability to express that to me, to any teacher, really. 90% of the time, it's a misunderstanding, right? I did not intend for that to be offensive, and I, I think maybe if you took offense that you, you, you missed the point. That's not really what I said. That's I, I said this and meant this. The other 10% of the time, it's intentional. This is ethics, after all, and if I don't push the buttons, if I don't provoke you, if I don't disturb you, then I'm not doing my job. Ethics is where our morality meets the, the reality of the world. And sometimes those two things do clash and we need to confront that. Let 
and sometimes, maybe 1% of the time, never mind my math, it's something that I didn't understand. This chapter talks a little bit about microaggressions and how that might be a misnomer, a, a, a poor label. Um, right? Because I grew up in a certain time, in a certain era, and in a certain region where you might say something that is not meant to be degrading or humiliating or marginalizing, yet it comes across that way. Just saying things like, ah, you kids, right? I am dismissing your thoughts and opinions and feelings simply because of your age and a perceived immaturity. We can dismiss them because they are blank, right? And thus the whole debate about, oh, is OK Boomer and Karen the new N-word? Well, if you're not going to say the N-word, but you're going to say Boomer and Karen, then maybe they're not equivalent, right? We do it all the time. Ageism, sexism, racism, religionism, politicizing, all the way down. What do we call this virus that's causing all of these problems? Wuhan virus? That Chinese virus? Kung flu? Okay, I like that one. Um, right? I think part of it is, no doubt, a desire to protect others. And sometimes we simply take ourselves far too seriously, which I hope is a, is a lesson that you've learned from me. Yes, take others seriously, but never yourself. That's just some life advice. Free to those who show up. The other problem is, when we begin policing words, how do we do it, right? Um, I remember, you know, uh, the first time in Sunday school when we read the story about Balaam's ass in the Old Testament. Yeah, you know, scandalized, right? Because it meant donkey. Donkey started talking. It was a really weird scene, man. Uh, but, you know, and, and, you know, we children titter because that's the word that's used. Or the word hell. Right? In, in the context of Sunday school, you could say, ah, sinners go to hell. But if I said, and stubbed my toe and went, ah, hell! That's a paddling. Back in the days when you could do that, even in church. Wow. What are these words? How do we police them? How do we enforce them? I think I told you guys already that my first words were, oh, shit. Because that's what I heard my mom say all day. I'm not sure if they were before or after Mama and Dada, but they were pretty close. Our country has a history of protecting free speech. The courts again and again and again, even in the 50s and 60s, protected the freedom of speech and burning the flag. That was a big one back in the 80s as well. 
as to as to whether or not that was an okay thing. Um, and I'm going to leave that for you guys. I, I would like us to have a bit of a discussion about it. Why should I simply pontificate on freedom of speech and not give you a voice either? So that's what the homework is going to be. Uh, I'm going to open it up as a discussion board, and I would like everyone to make a post and to make two thoughtful replies to two other students' posts. So you make your initial post, then go back, look at what somebody else said, and reply to that. But, you know, pick at least two students to reply to. Um, and, and let's get a roll, a conversation, a ball going. Um, feel free to disagree. Feel free to express dissenting opinion. Feel free, especially, to back it up with logic and reason. We refrain from personal attack. Why? Because it's offensive? No, because it's illogical. There's the difference. There's a great quote in here, or maybe it's kind of a paraphrasing of John Stuart Mill. Yes, that Mill, the same Mill from utilitarianism, talking about why it is necessary to have freedom of speech. And, and essentially it boils down to this, that without it, we cannot test the truth. And if truth becomes untestable, then it becomes dead dogma. You just, here's the thing you believe, accept it, don't question it, and move on. Which, you know, most religions would like us to do. But... Even I have a major problem with that. If you cannot question God, then what kind of God is this God? Right? If God exists and created us in God's own image and gave us these brains, then I assume that God expects us to use them. Dubitu ergo sum, and all of that. So, with freedom of thought is freedom of speech. These two things are inextricably linked. And we cannot pursue the truth if we are not allowed to talk and think. Even despicable ideas, even words that are certainly filled with hate. Because they're just words. And as uh, some great men have said, hate does not overcome hate. Only love does, and truth. And so, yes, I would uphold, or at least I would, you know, certainly understand that point of view that says, no, we must allow hate speech so that it can be proven for what it is. It is truth, and the relentless pursuit of truth that allows freedom to flourish. Besides, if you're offended, now what? <gasps> you offend me, sir! Okay, cool. So? Enjoy. Maybe you disagree. I hope you do. I'll see you in the comment section. Bye.